This evening is the first in a monthly series of webcasts that will be leading up until the uh, October Garden States event. Next month, we'll have uh, Garden States Microdose webcast episode 2, Cannabis and San Pedro Australiana Cultivation, featuring Tom Forrest and Liam Engel. That'll be on Wednesday the 24th of March from 8pm, and you can sign up at gardenstates.org. And in October, on Friday the 1st and Saturday the 2nd of October, a forum for cultivating ethnobotanical plants, knowledge and community, Garden States event featuring Keeper Trout, Bruce Pascoe, Margaret Ross, Janet Lawrence, David Holmgren, Alison Puglio, Suresh, uh, Suresh, I'm not going to try and butcher that, <laughs> and Dr. Martin Williams. Gardenstates.org is where you can find the tickets and it will be fantastic to see everybody in person once more. Good evening, my name's Nick, and before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this continent and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'm meeting here today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, but our friendly moderators who are there for you in the comments section of this YouTube live stream will drop in a website that you can go to and find out what land you're on if you're unsure. Do go and find out. Sovereignty was never ceded. We'll be screening uh, also later on uh, a couple of uh, Seedlings Projects videos. Now the Seedlings Project uh, started with our first live stream last year when we were all getting used to the new online space uh, during these global pandemic times. Uh, and we're looking for submissions from the community. You can find out the guidelines of how you can uh, get involved at the website entheogenesis.org, which again will be dropped into the uh, chat. Uh, and you can look for the Seedlings Project there and submit something because uh, we'd love to hear from you. This is a two-way conversation. Uh, and that goes for during tonight's webcast as well. It is a two-way conversation. If you do have any questions or comments, do drop them into the uh, chat, into the comments. Uh, make sure to subscribe to the EGA YouTube channel as well, Entheo TV, so that you can find out uh, a lot more content. There are 80-odd uh, videos on there now. It's probably not quite 80, but it's getting very close to uh, 80. And I just want to say a big thank you as well to those who were able to make a donation for tonight's event. Uh, it helps us to continue putting these on and to build towards uh, more events, especially in person in October. Um, having a look, what have I forgotten? Nothing. <laughs> uh, on tonight's uh, show, um, and I, I actually, before I get into that, that's what I've forgotten. Not every show is going to be the same. Uh, we're going to be showing a variety of uh, talks, forums, and uh, also uh, submissions from the community on these webcasts. So please do send us your ideas at the Entheogenesis uh, website. And remember that uh, if, uh, if if this if there isn't a topic for you one month, there's likely to be one in a different month. So do sign up for the EGA mailing letter, uh, uh, mailing newsletter at the Entheogenesis website. Uh, when, you, when you sign up, you'll get uh, regular updates on what's going on. So for tonight's show, uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Nigel Strauss. Uh, so Dr. Nigel Strauss will be our, uh, our guest speaker. He's a practicing psychiatrist with a special interest in psychedelic medicines and their application in the treatment of psychiatric illness. He's currently involved in two research studies, one involving psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for the treatment of treatment-resistant depression, and the second involving MDMA-assisted psychotherapy in the treatment of treatment-resisted post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. He has co-authored Best Practice Guidelines for the Use of Psychedelic Medicines in Australia and is the coordinator of ANSPAP, and that's a double P in there because it stands for the Australian and New Zealand Psychiatrists for Psychedelic Assisted Psychotherapy. Uh, and it's a group aiming to bring together psychiatrists and others interested in this uh, sort of work. Nigel's particularly interested in the eventual safe introduction of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy into clinical practice. And I think it's a particularly uh, topical time to be talking about this. So without uh, further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Nigel Strauss. Nigel. Um, it's great to be here, and uh, thank you for having me, giving, the, giving me the opportunity to talk about a subject that's very close to my heart, which you've already described, and that is the safe introduction of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy into clinical practice in Australia. Um, I, I, I always, uh, I'm a, always a bit 
uh, reluctant with Zoom meetings because I can never see my audience. I'm sure you're a great bunch of people and uh, I hope you get something out of this talk. The, the upside, of course, is that I can be the barefoot psychiatrist and give this, uh, give this lecture in, in, without any shoes on. Now, the talk I'm gonna to give tonight is Society, Psychedelics and Psychiatry. And as, you've or, as Nick already pointed out, I'm involved, in fact, involved in three studies now. Um, the um, two studies that Nick mentioned, uh, that's the uh, psilocybin assisted psychotherapy for uh, uh, treatment resistant depression. And uh, we're doing that at uh, Swinburne University and uh, St. Vincent's Hospital. And uh, that is, uh, although we haven't started treating people yet, um, that's well underway. We have ethics approval and we, the training of therapists and so forth is happening uh, as we speak. And uh, the second trial is the uh, trial for uh, MD, uh, PTSD using MDMA-assisted uh, psychotherapy. And that's a trial I'm sponsoring. Uh, that's a trial that's very close to my heart because uh, in uh, 2015, uh, Martin Williams from prison and I attempted to uh, begin a trial like that to initiate a trial at Deakin University uh, in, uh, in Geelong, uh, where I was at that time an adjunct professor. And the night before we uh, were going to uh, apply and uh, submit our protocol to the, um, the ethics committee, we were told in no uncertain terms that they were not, the university was not interested, and that MAPS, that's the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Science in America that was supporting us and helping us. They're the group that is doing a lot of the research now. Uh, was, a, was an organisation that uh, supported illegal activity. And I've got that on paper and it's a letter that I've kept to this day and it's on my wall because it's, uh, it's been a long journey from there because MAPS is now very much part of the trial that we're doing at Monash University. So we've come a long way since then and I'm proud to say that uh, this research is, is going to be a big step forward. MAPS is actually uh, providing free training uh, for our therapists and it's a very ex exciting development. As well as that, I'm now involved in um, a third trial, and that's uh, Dr. Mark Ross's trial at St. Vincent's, which is the first, you may know this, but it's the first trial uh, in the modern era to um, occur in Australia, and that is the use of uh, psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy uh, for end-of-life anxiety and depression. Um, Dr. Mark Ross is interested in palliative care, and she has been an extraordinary uh, pioneer in that she set up the first trial in Australia and she's to be greatly admired for that. And it's an honor to be invited on as a, uh, as a um, investigator and as a therapist to that trial. So the way I look at it um, is that the introduction of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy into Australia is occurring, has occurred in three stages. We're in the second stage. The first stage was the advocacy stage, where as I've just explained, we had a few hurdles to jump. Uh, we were rejected by a number of people and uh, th there were some moments of challenge. But we're well into the second stage where we've got all these research programs uh, going. And uh, I think that um, it's a very exciting period and I'm reasonably confident that in a year or two, uh, when overseas results become more uh, available and we see that this research is effective, I'm reasonably certain in a year or two we'll be able to roll this treatment out uh, generally and introduce it into Australia. But um, my, my belief is that we have to do this carefully and slowly and the research is very important. We have to learn about it, introduce it to therapists and so forth. And uh, we have to adopt the precautionary principle and do it well and carefully. So tonight um, I want to take a, a sort of a, a sociological approach. Uh, I don't want to give you too much detail. I don't want to go through all the detail about the trials and so forth. That's already been spoken about and is available. But I, I want to look at this uh, sociologically and how this process is evolving and the challenges that exist and, and the problems that's, that still occur along the way. Um, and I want to do that um, by telling you um, some stories. But before I do that, uh, I want to um, just give you a little bit of uh, theory. I won't burden you with too much, don't worry. Um, but I want to say that in 
the experience of being alive, there are two ways of uh, looking at the world. Um, the first way, and they are logos and mythos. Don't be frightened by those words, but logos, um, here's the slide. Logos is to do with reason and logic and measurement and empiricism. We objectify things and we can measure them and we can learn a lot from them. That's, I'm really talking about science here. Science is really based on logos, where we separate ourselves from what we're measuring. We come up with conclusions. And as we all know, uh, science is, uh, has provided an enormous amount uh, to progress, human progress over the years. Um, that's the first way of looking at the world. The second way is all to do with mythos. Mythos, as you can tell, is all to do with stories. Logos, can we have, a, can we have the next slide, please? please? Logos can tell us uh, something about the world. We can measure things, but it doesn't tell us everything about the world. Life's a mystery, and um, science can't answer questions uh, which give us understanding about meaning, about grief, about suffering. Um, how to live our lives. Um, science can't tell us that, but stories can. Stories have been very valuable for as long as mankind has been, or humankind has been around, um, because stories tell us how to live our lives. Religious stories were made not to be dog dogmatically interpreted, but to give people ideas about how to live life productively and well. And that's the case now with literature. The stories that are told, that are written, they get us into other people's minds, into other people's situations, and they are explanatory, and they help us make decisions about how we out personally should live our lives. Uh, they, they help us with ethical questions, um, and uh, they answer uh, questions that science can't answer. So they're the two ways of, of, of looking at the world. And I want to look at the, this whole topic in a, in a mythos type of way, and I'm going to tell you some stories. I'm going to tell you a story about me. I won't, it won't be too long and it won't be too boring. And then I'm going to tell you a story about psychiatry. And then I'm going to talk about stories in relation to psychedelics. So the first story is about me. And it goes back a number of years. And I, I, it's all to do with my um, experiences as a medical student. I went into medicine for various reasons and uh, found it extremely challenging and really uh, not what I expected it to be. I spent many years um, taking in facts and then regurgitating them. I learned about limbs and arteries and metabolism and pathology and all these things uh, that were part of a human being, but there was nothing holistic about it. And, and by the time I got to fourth or fifth year, I was pretty despondent. And uh, in retrospect, I think I might have been clinically depressed, but um, I'm not sure. But I wasn't a happy traveller. Anyway, I got to fifth year. And uh, one of the terms that I had to do in fifth year medicine, uh, as, you, as you do, you have to do gynecology and surgery and paediatrics. One of them was psychiatry. I went into psychiatry first day and I started talking to people, people who told me their stories. And suddenly I realised, hey, this is great. I was hearing stories. I was seeing the whole person and, and I was uh, in a situation where I could learn about people learn about the whole of the person, not bits and pieces, but the whole person. And that for me was uh, revelatory. And the light globe went on and I knew that uh, I wanted to be a psychiatrist. And I loved every minute of that term. And I finished my medical course knowing I'd be a psychiatrist and I was a psychiatrist at the age of 27, a qualified psychiatrist. You couldn't do that today. And I've been a psychiatrist ever since and still love it, still love listening to stories. And to me, that is the essence of psychiatry, is hearing people's stories and helping them with their stories and through the challenges that their stories involve. So that's the story of me. And now the story of psychiatry. Now, psychiatry um, is an interesting story because there are two aspects of psychiatry which at times rub up against each other. There's looking at logos, the way of looking at psychiatry through the logos, that is the logical scientific ways, we look at the brain, whereas you look at psychiatry using mythos, we hear the stories that people tell us. That's the mind. The brain is all the physical side of things and the mind is what the brain does. Now, always in psychiatry, there's been a sort of tension between the mythos and the logos, between the brain and the mind. And that's still the case. When I was... Um, a young psychiatrist, people like Freud and Jung were still fashionable. 
and they told stories. Their way of understanding human, human behaviour was by stories. For example, Freud talked about the, the myth of Oedipus. Jung took it even further and uh, went into all sorts of mythological studies. And he used those stories, those myths, to elaborate on his theories of human behaviour and functioning. I was hooked by Jung because I love mythology. And I actually went to Switzerland and for a while spent some time at the Jung Institute in Zurich. And uh, I, uh, I think it's unfortunate that as time's gone on since then, psychiatry's focused more on the logos, on the science. Now, I'm not putting science down. It's helpful and it's valuable. But psychiatry's focused on that to the point where these days, and, and please don't, I'm not, I'm not here to criticise psychiatrists. I have many, many colleagues who are doing a great job and they understand exactly what I'm talking about. But the discipline of psychiatry tends to focus more on science rather than on the, the, the mythos. And what happens is patients come in, they, they, they uh, ask about the symptoms that they have, they're not sleeping, they're feeling down, they're crying. Then they get a diagnosis, which is depression, say, and for that diagnosis, uh, we're given a treatment such as antidepressants. And uh, that's a sort of reductive approach to psychiatry. And unfortunately, that can be, people can take that too seriously and they can forget about the person that is giving you that account of events. They're forgetting about the person's story. Uh, and it's a reductive approach, which I think can be problematic. We do need science, and I'm sure that science can contribute a lot to psychiatry. But up until now, we really don't know a lot about how the mind and the brain work. As much as we'd like to, know, to say that, we, that we've learned a lot, there's still a long way to go. We don't know the causes of many psychiatric conditions. Uh, we don't know how the treatments work. And uh, there's a real struggle uh, in psychiatry to advance the field. And I think one of the things we need to do is to go back to the, the mythos, the stories, the individuals, how are they living their lives? How do they feel? How do they see the world? That sort of focus. Okay, so the problem, this creates a problem, there's several problems, but in particular, if we're going to introduce psychedelic assisted psychotherapy uh, into psychiatry, there's gonna to have to be a shift in psychiatry away from the logos to the mythos because psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is so uh, much involved with stories that the psychotherapy is storytelling, it's talking, and that's the, the basis of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Psychiatry is going to have to shift its axis a little bit to accept that into its, to accept psychedelics into psychiatry. It's going to have to focus a little bit more on the story side of things. And that's one of the things that I try and um, uh, convince my colleagues of. But again, I want to say that my, many of my colleagues really understand what I'm saying. But as a psychiatrist talking like this, um, I embody that tension between the logos and the, psych and the mythos. When I treat, when I'm, in, when I'm with patients, it's not an issue. I want to hear their story. But when I speak publicly, I feel that tension between the two sides of psychiatry. And we hopefully psychiatry will swing back a bit to the mythos and the two sides of psychiatry will work more effectively together. Okay, so that's, um, that's the story of uh, psychiatry. Now I want to talk about um, the story of psychedelics. Now, when we get to psychedelics, the stories abound. There are stories everywhere, uh, and they just keep, they, they, they keep growing. The stories of psychedelics create stories. We, we, we begin with the history of psychedelics, goes back thousands of years um, to uh, indigenous peoples in various parts of the world, some of them we know used psychedelics, some of which we don't know, but a lot of people believe that they did use psychedelics, but we don't have any proof of that. And the shamans are involved um, in the, uh, the use of these drugs in many parts of the world. And um, shamanism, the definition of shamanism is the technology of ecstasy, interestingly. I like that definition. Now, the word shaman, of course, conjures up all sorts of stories. Uh, shamans have been uh, involved in the ayahuasca ceremonies in South America. And as you know, um, ayahuasca ceremonies are happening all over the world now. And I, I, I suppose uh, people who administer the, the ayahuasca call them shelf shamans. The whole story of shamans is, is enormous. Uh, as you know, there are shamans now invading uh, the Pentagon. Um, there was a recent uh, episode where a well-known shaman, he was in all the papers. So that story is enormous in itself. But um, 
if we come to the, the Western view on uh, psychedelic drugs, uh, we begin about 150 years ago with, I think it was Germans who first investigated mescaline from the peyote. Uh, and then, um, I, I can't tell you all the stories, there's so many, but then we come to Albert Hoffman, who synthesized LSD. And uh, there's a famous story about Albert riding home on a bike uh, on, under the influence of LSD, with a very strange trip. And people now celebrate that every year with bike rides. There's a whole story behind that. But then um, uh, the drug companies um, got a hold of the LSD uh, and uh, provided it to psychiatrists all over the world, including Australia, and research began using them. And then there's this wonderful story, again, another story. I love this story, and I have it, I visualize this story of the, the, the chemical uh, psilocybin or LSD escaping from the laboratory. Just imagine a chemical running down the road, and say in San Francisco, chemical running down the road and some guy with long hair sees it, grabs it, eats it, you hate Ashbury and suddenly you've got this uh, escape of the chemical and it's out there in the counterculture and it changes everything. You get uh, psychedelic music, you get psychedelic art uh, and there's this whole sort of counterculture development um, that uh, comes along and the story is it really pisses off Richard Nixon but in the interim you've got uh, Timothy Leary and you've got Ram Dass, endless stories uh, created by this phenomenon. Um, then Richard Nixon decides that, uh, and he very rudely describes some of the psychiatrists who are prescribing it. I won't go into details, but you can look it up. It's very interesting. Richard Nixon with a scowl on his face saying, we can't have this with the Vietnam War, with cultures changing, more and more stories. So he brings in prohibition and uh, ultimately the research stops, but not before people try and um, uh, change that, but they lose in the, in, the, in, the, in the courts of America and the psychedelic research all over the world stops. And then um, uh, the, the drug continues to be used in the underground for therapeutic purposes and it's still used for recreational purposes, but we're not allowed to research it for many, many years. And then you've got the story of my friend Rick Doblin, who um, had a um, set up this organization, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Science, that's a whole other story. Rick's a legend in his own time, a wonderful man who's done so much to, to evolve this process. Uh, the story of um, the Good Friday experiment, on and on it goes. But Rick's, uh, Rick meets Michael Mithofer, who's the psychiatrist who's done so much work in the development of, um, of psychedelic research. Uh, he's written manuals, he's taught, he taught me uh, about how to be a, a psychedelic therapist. And now we're getting to the, the, the point of the where, where MAPS is about to uh, write papers about their, state, their phase three studies. So um, it's a, there's a lot of stories. There's a lot of stories. And um, the conclusion, and I've been recently quoted on this, and I think it's true that the word psychedelic, because of all these stories, has reached the level of words like God, sex, and money. The word creates so many human projections that it can mean any. It means so much to so many people, and um, that's okay. But um, uh, thanks for that slide. That's okay. But what does someone like me, who's interested in research, uh, do um, in this situation where um, one is trying to do research? and one is um, uh, affected by a whole lot of different influences uh, who have different views on how um, psychedelic drugs should be used and introduced. The, could we, we could have that slide again, please. Um, the, the first group, and I've mentioned it already, is the peak body, that is my college, uh, who have supported research, which is great, but there's, there's limited understanding within the College of Psychiatrists about what we're trying to do, the effect of these drugs and the potential of these drugs. There's still stigma. Uh, there's still people who think they're bad drugs. So there's still a, a way to go. Although I think it's important that as a psychiatrist, uh, we have the support of the College of Psychiatrists. And I'm trying to encourage that uh, with mixed success. Um, there are the... Um, there's the underground therapists who continue to treat people with psychedelics saying that they just can't wait and there's all these people who need the treatment. That's fine and I don't know anything about underground therapists but I imagine some of them are okay but it worries me that there are no regulations 
and that things could easily go wrong. And I think it's very important that we bring this stuff up above the surface and do the research, learn about it carefully with precautions and ultimately, hopefully deliver a product which is safe and will help people for, with specific problems. Um, there are people who have a sort of um, evangelistic approach to this saying, we just got to get the stuff out there and start treating people legally. Um, that's all very well. But again, I think that uh, we need to do this research and we need to do it properly and carefully. And then, then there's the, the people who think they're going to make money out of psychedelics. And I want to read a little, something I saw in the paper last week, um, which is, I think, quite illustrative of how um, people sort of uh, want to make money out of it. They don't get it either because they just see it as a product uh, that everybody wants. So this guy who's a billionaire wrote this. Um, I had never smoked or had alcohol. A lot of people trusted me in those days because I was known for being clean. Then I tried a mushroom, I, whether that's being dirty or not, I don't know. Then I tried a mushroom for the first time and it was the, the single most meaningful thing I'd done in my life. It's very hard to put in language, but it was like meeting my soul and it gave me long lasting, deep happiness. Now, boy, is he marketing his product? That sort of attitude where it's gonna give you long lasting happiness um, really is a good selling point, but whether it's realistic or fair is another issue. And what worries me is that people come into this area thinking they're gonna make a lot of money, but they don't really understand the implications and the applications for these drugs in a psychiatric sense. Recre I don't have an opinion on recreational use and self-development, but I'm talking about my interest is as a psychiatrist and helping people with severe distress who can't be treated with other modalities. Okay, so um, uh, the way I like to uh, view psychedelics is that psychedelic drugs are a technology. Uh, a technology enhances, builds on existing skills uh, that human beings possess. Um, what, what, what psychedelics do is they magnify psychotherapy. It's psychotherapy on steroids, if you like. The key point is that when people take psychedelic drugs, they are extremely suggestible. You can take a psychedelic drug and uh, believe in Charles Manson, or you can take a psychedelic drug in, the, in a certain setting and listen to believe the prophets. So you can go either way. Psychedelics as a technology are no different to cars and nuclear power or guns. Um, nuclear power can light up a city or it can blow up a city. Um, uh, cars can take granny to hospital or run granny over. And psychedelics can be like that too. They can be used destructively or constructively. So the key is the psychotherapy, the treatment that goes with it. The psychedelics are just a technology. It's how we use them that's the key. And I think we've got to keep that in mind um, because um, if, if we don't, things can go awry. So the, the psychotherapy is just as important as the drug, if not more. And, you know, when people talk about taking it and having lasting happiness, that may be the case, but it may not be the case. So what, is, what, what let me just briefly talk about the psychotherapy and the importance of the psychotherapy. Psychotherapy um, is talking therapy. And, and there's a generic approach to psychotherapy. There's all sorts of psychotherapy. There's Freudian analysis, there's cognitive behavior therapy, there's compassionate therapy, all sorts of therapies. But the generic key to psychotherapy is what Carl Rogers talked about. And that is just listening to people with compassion and empathy, hearing their story and becoming involved in their story and helping people self-heal and change their story. They do the work. The psychotherapist is there to guide and, and help. And that is the key, I think, to the psychedelic psychotherapy. It's not, it's not rocket science, but it's supportive and can be directive. But we do not want um, the psychotherapist bringing a whole lot of their story into the individual story. So there are three stages to the psychotherapy. There's the introduction, and that's three or four sessions of psychotherapy. There's the dosing psychotherapy session. And then there's the integration. Now, when um, we, we introduce um, people to the introductory sessions are all about building up trust with the therapist, but we 
tell the person, we don't tell them they're going to have some sort of amazing mystical experience because not everybody has. We tell them about the possibilities. If we could just have the next slide, please. Um, we talk about changes in self-perception, feelings of connectedness, intense emotional experience. All these things can happen um, when um, somebody uh, takes the drug. But the, the important thing is that we don't introduce God or transcendental unification systems as therapists. We just take people's stories. So people might come in who are religious, have particular belief systems, and we allow that, of course. We don't try and stop that. And if it's intensified during the dosing session, that's fantastic. We aren't there to um, tell people about our belief systems or we don't bring in Buddhist icons into the therapy because we think that's important for the patient. The patient has to be, has to find their own meaning, their own connection. And this is all about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. It's all about connecting. The people I think will benefit the most from psychedelic assisted psychotherapy are people who have lost connection, have lost meaning. They've lost what's important to them. And the psychedelic process opens up the mind so that these connections can be reestablished. Um, some people say, oh, well, you, you, um, your ego is, um, your e if we can just show that slide in a minute, your ego is um, broken down and you can connect to much bigger things. You can, you can transcend yourself. Aldous Huxley said that there are filters on the sensory information that comes in, the filters are gone. Other people talk about the default, default mode network, that there's less blood supply to various parts of the brain. It doesn't matter what story you bring to it. Uh, science isn't really that helpful. It's basically that you're opened up to enhance possibilities in a very intense way. And those sort of connections are re-established. And I think the people who are really going to be helped by psychedelics are people, particularly psilocybin, are people who have lost connection, they've lost meaningful experience, and they can regain it in these intense experiences in the dosing session. Now, they might have an intense experience, but at the end of the day, uh, what's important is the third part of the psychotherapy, which is integration. Uh, and the integration is the follow-up. It's, if I can just give you an example of that, I, I've done a number of um, intensive meditation retreats and uh, they really are mind-changing. You, you, you meditate for 10 days, you don't talk, and at the end of that, you really are changed uh, and you come away with a whole different consciousness. Now, you, you go back into your normal life, it's busy, there's lots going on, you try and meditate for a week or two, it's still intense, and then after that, it fades away, and after about a month, you not back where you were, but you've lost a lot of that intensity that you come out of at the end of the meditation retreat. And similarly, I think, with the psychedelic experience, you come out with this profound experience, but if you don't do anything about it and you just go back to normal life, often a lot's not gained. And in the, in the psychotherapy situation, I'm talking about people who might have illnesses, it's very important that they change direction in their life, they learn new habits, whether it's meditation or yoga or make new friends or develop belief systems or intensify their religious beliefs, that has to perpetuate if there's going to be permanent change. And I'm concerned that if the psych psychotherapy isn't managed in that way, when we roll this out, all sorts of problems um, might develop. So um, I don't want to uh, talk for much longer. I don't know, I haven't been following the time. Um, but um, I do want to um, finish off by just talking about potential problems, just very briefly before I finish off. Um, this, this treatment's gonna be expensive. You've got two therapists, normally you have two therapists, a dyad, and um, it's, a lot, it's 12 weeks, and um, we, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how we're gonna meet that, that cost. It's gonna be an expensive treatment, and that could be, uh, it, it might, might mean that people who can afford it can have it, and people who can't afford it can't have it. So that's one of the challenges. Uh, I'm also concerned that people will cut corners and minimize the psychotherapy and just sell it as an opportunity for people to take psychedelics not as a treatment so much. <clears throat> I'm, I'm concerned that people will promise this treatment as a panacea, that it's going to cure all psychiatric illnesses. It's not. Nothing will. But it will, as I've said, um, help some people. And uh, we have to be honest about who it will help and who it won't. Um, 
The other thing is that uh, I'm concerned about what sort of regulations there will be for, for therapists and, and other people who um, are involved in this. How are we going to control the training? How are we going to control the regulations? How, how are we going to regulate it? And uh, so they, without labouring, there will be problems and we need to keep that in mind when this thing rolls out. So um, I'd just like to finish up by thanking um, EGA for allowing me to talk tonight. I'd also like to um, thank my colleagues at PRISM, um, which is a, a really hardworking organisation, particularly Stephen Bright and Martin Williams. Martin's been a colleague for many years. But Stephen and Martin at PRISM, PRISM's the Australian organisation that encourages something. So it's been around for a long time. I came into it much later than Martin and Stephen and, uh, and various other people. But they've been uh, supportive colleagues and Stephen, I know, is doing research over in, in Perth, which is exciting. Martin's been involved in all the research that I've done and he's an extraordinary man. He's contributed so much. Uh, I'd also, if, if there are ANSPAP members listening tonight, I'd like to thank them for supporting me and the organisation, even though it's still a loose organisation, hopefully it will become stronger. And so, and I thank you all for, for listening to me tonight. And I think, as I understand it, there's going to be a short break and then I'm open to questions. So thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nigel Strauss. And as Nigel said, we will be taking some questions. So if you do have questions, do drop them into the comments now and our kind moderators will be collecting those up and we'll get to those in just a minute. Uh, what I'm gonna play for you now is from the Seedlings Project. Uh, it is a community driven project. So if you have an idea that you'd like to uh, get out to us, then visit the Entheogenesis website, which has been dropped into the comments, and look for the Seedlings Project. There are guidelines there uh, for what we're looking for, and then we might screen your video next time. Don't forget to subscribe to the Entheogenesis Australis YouTube channel too. Hit that subscribe button. Oh, now I'm doing YouTube stuff. <laughs> Our car tracks were reground to a halt upon arrival. found it. Good
Oh, it last dead. Woohoo! Now there's enough left still for the night time and we have two more nozzles. And again, that is from the Entheogenesis Australis Seedlings Project, which you can find more out about at the Entheogenesis Australis website. Uh, and this is the first in a monthly series of webcasts that we'll be doing leading up to the October Garden States event. Uh, so we'll be screening seedlings videos every month and there'll be another one a little bit later. Um, but time now uh, for some questions. Nigel, uh, we'll start off. Uh, thank you for dropping your questions uh, in the comments as well. Uh, first question... First question. I've had to skip uh, skip one. I'm looking at you, Inika. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, in terms of disorders that psychedelic psychotherapy could treat, somebody's asked here about uh, whether or not it will be uh, able to treat um, eating disorders. Okay. Um, well, we don't know for sure. I think there's a couple of trials that are... Um, We'll start be starting soon, but I'm not exactly sure where they are. I'm not sure if they're going to be in Australia. Although I know for a fact that um, there's somebody interested in doing such a trial in Australia. Now, the um, there's not, first of all, we don't know for sure whether it will work with anorexia nervosa, but certainly there's a rigidity of thinking with anorexia nervosa, and this is an issue that uh, people think can be helped with psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So. It's, open, it's an open question, and I think that um, we'll find out soon. I, I suspect what we'll find is that some of the sufferers of this condition will be helped, but not necessarily all of them. But that's just a guess. Uh, and I think um, if, you know, if we had the resources, we'd, we'd like to do that research in Melbourne or Australia as, as soon as possible. The problem with the research is it's expensive, and we're not going to be um, supported by big pharma. They're not interested in that. And, the research is limited by who, who's going to provide the money. But I think a small trial probably will get going in Australia in, in the next year or two. So we'll find out. Our second question comes from uh, Shana asking, when you mention loss of connection regarding those uh, who treatment will be good for, are we talking uh, loss of connection with self, with others, with nature, with spirituality, or all of the above? All of, all of the above, definitely all of the above. Um, loss of connection, loss of me. I, I, I see all these words. These are words, and they can mean all sorts of things, but meaning, um, spirituality, connect, connection, in a sense, it all means the same thing. Meaning is what's important to you. And uh, I think that it can be your partner, it can be your family, it can be your friends, it can be an organisation, it can be a club. Uh, it can be an ideology, it can be a religion, it can be uh, the, the nature, it can be the world. So it's, it's connecting. Uh, human beings, the human condition is to connect. It's not to be alienated and isolated. In, in our society, there is a, our individualistic society, there's this tendency for people to become alienated. Loneliness, for example, is a symptom of that. And I think that that's a real problem. And although technology and all this virtual stuff and um, Facebook and all this, it does connect people, but one wonders if it's a real connection or a, 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 an artificial connection. I mean, that's a d debatable point, I know, but I think human beings like the warmth of flesh and I think they like people around them rather than, I prefer to be with a person than a screen, to be perfectly honest. And I think a lot of people might share that um, feeling. And, uh, you know, I think that... Um, we, 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 we find it, it's a cultural thing because I think in a, I, I, I don't have the time to elaborate on this, but an interest of mine is if we look at, if we look at um, indigenous culture, 
structures, which are much more collectively orientated, everybody's in it together without that sort of individuality. Um, the, 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 this concept of um, connection is, isn't as important. And the, in the ayahuasca ceremonies, as far as I understand, the shamans don't talk about some sort of unity experience that we might talk about in our psychotherapy. They talk about people confronting the other spirits or bad demons. So people who sink too much into the collective need a bit of a kick and they need to develop their egos a bit more. And so the shaman encourages them to deal with these spirits and meet these spirits. So that's the opposite effect. So we've got to remember that culture is a very important aspect of all of this and that not everybody um, thinks the way that individualistic societies think. Um, and, you know, just to ex expand on that even a bit more, um, there's two ways of looking at the world as well. So people, Indigenous people, but in their languages, not all of them, but a lot of them, they have a, a um, geocentric way of describing things. Instead of saying the bookshelf's on my left and the bed's on the right, they'd say uh, the bookshelf is north and the, uh, the cupboard south, so that you're not the centre of the world, you're just part of the world. And that's the collective approach. So the language is indicative of that, uh, that being part of something, whereas our language, we're the centre of the world. And when that goes awry, when there's too much of that, we become disconnected. And I think in our culture, that's where psychedelics are going to be helpful. And building on from that question uh, from people in their YouTube names. Uh, Cyanide Montouche. I might be putting too much of a Frenchness on there. It could just be Montouche, Montouche, um, is asking, are we open to all sorts of psychedelics or are we talking about just a few? And also, um, uh, should we be building on uh, indigenous knowledge of psychedelics uh, as, as a base to, 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 uh, to work from? I think at this stage, um, we're at a pretty primitive level. Uh, we're using psilocybin in a lot of the research because it's, you know, uh, uh, a, uh, what's the word, not a down market LSD, but an LSD with far less punch and it's safe to use in trials. I think as time goes on uh, and we get a handle on this and it becomes more acceptable, we'll start to use all the, uh, hopefully, we'll, we, we'll be able to investigate all psychedelics. It, it all comes down to, the safety of research. I think research is important. Um, and I think that uh, whether they're synthesized or, or naturally occurring psychedelics, I think there's a huge space for research. And, uh, you know, I look forward to that. It might not occur in my lifetime, but certainly will occur in the future. And um, I'm optimistic that will occur, but uh, slowly, slowly. On the uh, practicalities of when research could be uh or when psychotherapy could be happening in australia um do you have a, a timeline that you envision uh for when psychedelic psychotherapy might be available in australia um and and we'll build on that question after you answer that part well i i'm i'm optimistic that it'll happen in a year or two i think uh, maps is going to um be publishing their their results from their phase three trials and uh once that uh, if that shows promise of really good results, then I think the FDA will move to uh, legalise and, and support uh, legal MDMA treatment for um, post-traumatic stress disorder. As soon as that happens, I think that will we, we'll, we'll jump on the bandwagon here and I see the TGA rescheduling. Um, I think that um, that could happen within a year or two. COVID slowed the research up a bit, but I think that'll happen in a year or two. Uh, and similarly with psilocybin, I, I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic that um, when things move from overseas, it's not going to be Australia, um, Australian derived. I think the, our trials are small. Um, the only randomised control trial is Mark Ross's at St Vincent's. The other trials I'm involved in are open label uh, and, and scientists demand randomised control trials, even though it's extremely difficult to do randomised control trials with psychedelics because it's very hard to blind and everyone knows uh, that look, most people know that they've taken a psychedelic. But um, look, I'm optimistic a year or two, uh, we'll start to see a rollout. And that's why we're getting ready here. We're tra training, um, training people. Uh, we're um, doing more and more research and this sort of programming is also very helpful. We get information out to people who are interested. A uh, question from Lucy in the comments. 
Uh, I'm not sure what these acronyms are, so I hope uh, I hope you know, Nigel. But uh, will training eventually be offered to PACFA? That's P A C F A and ACA certified psychotherapists, or is it like to, likely to only be psychiatrists involved in the treatment process? Oh no! Um, look, the, the, these guidelines. I've, I've, I've written these guidelines. Um, I don't know if you can see them, but anyway, the best practice clinical guidelines for the use of psychedelic medicines in Australia and New Zealand. Um, they're pretty rigid to begin with because the psychiatrists have to prescribe these drugs. And I, I think it's very important that psychiatrists who get involved in this work understand the psychotherapeutic aspects. As I've said, you know, at the moment, psychiatry and psychotherapy aren't really comfortable um, bedfellows. But um, ultimately, um, I think that the psychotherapy can be done with people. I, look, I don't know what those acronyms are either, to be perfectly honest, but certainly um, psychologists and people who've done the appropriate training programs, they don't have to be psychiatrists to be the psychotherapists. Um, psychiatrists are going to have to be involved one way or another to prescribe these drugs. But I envisage community clinics that specialise in this area um, where there, where there are uh, counsellors, psychologists, psychiatrists, all working together as a team, uh, not necessarily hierarchical, um, providing these treatments, um, as long as everyone's experienced and there's good support and reinforcement, uh, it should work well. So I don't think we need to limit it, certainly wouldn't limit it to psychiatrists only, no. Uh, a few questions from those seeking uh, information on uh, where to go for training, uh, what to study if they want to get involved with psychedelic uh, psychotherapy or psychiatry in the future. Um, where can people go if they want to get some training or just start out in the first place? Well, uh, these are early days, um, and I think that um, it's important uh, for training. Uh, what we're doing in the research programs, and we're going to be advertising shortly for people to become involved in the uh, MDMA trial, uh, that that the training involve patients, real patients. There's one thing to do a theoretical training, but it's very important, I think, to do a training with real patients and have that appropriate supervision. Um, that it would be inappropriate, I think, just to do a theoretical training and not have any practical experience. In psychology and psychiatry, we, we learn, we're, we're apprenticed, and we learn with patients how to do it. Um, so um, I think that's, that's pretty important. Um, and I think we'll find as um, time goes on that more and more training uh, becomes available in Australia and overseas as well. Um, that's pretty much all of the questions. There is a, a final one. I feel like it's the can of worms uh, question. So maybe we can uh, finish up on that question unless there are any more that I see in the comments. Um, oh, hang on. Uh, I've got one more along the lines of what we were just talking about from Jennifer. Uh, do you anticipate that trained GPs will also be able to prescribe psychedelics uh, within the therapy framework as well as psychiatrists? Uh, um, I, I think um, ultimately, yes. I think it sh it, the, if they show an interest in, in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and they're prepared to do the appropriate training, I don't see why it needs just to be uh, psychiatrists. I think that, um, you know, they, they should have some sort of obviously need psychological support, but there's no reason why a general practitioner couldn't do a training program and, um, and then qualified to be able to prescribe it. I think that might be a bit further down the road. Uh, it won't be up to me as to who can do it and who can't. I think initially it should be psychiatrists. It's a limited number of people who, you know, showing interest. But I think ultimately general practitioners and addiction specialists and other doctors who uh, are interested should be able to prescribe it. And I think that will eventuate. I don't want to put anybody off. Um, there's a couple of questions on the chat. Um, that there's one um, which studying psychology would be a good place to start if someone was hoping to eventually become a facilitator. I think so, definitely. Um, a clinical psychology qualification would be an excellent qualification in this in this area. Uh, and someone's asked how and when will we see results of the trials? Well, they'll be published. Um, uh, certainly once the trials are over next year or two, um, they'll come to fruition. I'd recommend as and well. Someone's asked what about thought? Sorry. 
Oh no, that, I, I was going to say I recommend as well uh, the Prism website. That's P R i s m dot org dot a u uh who do uh publish articles on the results and you'll be able to find links there um and they have a brand new website as well so do go check that out p r i s m dot org dot a u and i think you're just about to uh open the can of worms uh question uh nigel so let's finish up on that the big farmer question um what someone said what are my thoughts on big farmer well um, I think big pharma in this case are going to be these sort of billionaires who, you know, promising p- perpetual happiness if you buy their product. Um, I, I, I think that big pharma is not that interested in psychotherapy, and that's one of the problems we're going to have with funding. Um, but look, if people are genuinely um, can really want to do this properly and, and, and want to get involved in the psychotherapy and uh, support the, the cost of this, uh, then they will. But um, if it's just transactional and it's based on the profit motive, I'm a bit sceptical about whether they will become involved, unfortunately. These are questions that really are open at the moment about where the funding is going to come from. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that if the results are really powerful, um, government might get involved because the cost to the community of, psychi- of, many, of much of psychiatric illness is enormous uh, and, and, and recent um, government inquiries have shown that. And I think that... Uh, if our results prove to be effective, then governments may get involved because, you know, if you have someone on antidepressants for 50 years, um, that's pretty expensive too in the long run. It might be better to spend a whole lot of money in the short term, um, cure these people, get them up, get them going uh, so they don't need long-term treatment as opposed to someone who's on antidepressants for 30, 40 years with side effects, having to see their doctor, having to get the prescription, taking pills every day. Uh, Think about what might be the better approach and the overall cost benefit, uh, even though it's expensive initially, might be worthwhile. Final one to leave you on. I'm not sure if you'll know the direct answer to this. Um, so I suspect uh, uh, the, the answer to this might be keep your eye out on all the social channels, subscribe to things like the EGA uh, newsletter, follow uh, on social media, psychedelic organisations. But Nigel, do you know where uh, somebody could go to become a volunteer in upcoming uh, psychedelic trials? A volunteer to help? In the trial, is that was that the question I'd imagine? I, or, or I'm suspecting subject? it's to be a participant. Um, that's I'm I'm making uh, an assumption there, but <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Well, um, I think probably um, if they contact your organisation, I'll leave a email address for people to contact with your organisation, so they can contact you for that. If that's okay with you. Yep, I think that makes sense. And I've just flashed your email address up there uh, on the screen. Uh, so if, uh, if anybody need, wants to uh, take that down, then you can do that. Um, thank you very much, Nigel. Uh, and um, really appreciate you chatting to us about this um, really interesting and blossoming topic uh, at the moment. So I suspect there'll be more to talk about in the coming months. And I hope we can uh, have you back on to talk in the future. Thanks very much for having me. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And before we finish up tonight, I just want to again let you know that in October on the 1st and the 2nd, Friday the 1st and uh, Saturday the 2nd of October is the Garden States event. Uh, First event back in person for Entheogenesis Australis um, since we have been in pandemic times. And it's two full days of ethnobotanical knowledge sharing on plants, fungi or fungi, depending on what your flavor of mushroom is, and the environment. The EGA program will explore relationships between humankind and plants, including gardening, conservation, and sustainability, culture, art, spirituality, excuse me, (laughs) philosophy, research, and politics. Garden States is designed to encourage community building around medicinal plants, research, and psychedelic culture. Get your hands dirty and learn from the experts on how to grow and share ethnobotanical plants. Participate in community-led learning and meet like-minded botanical folk from across Australia. And next month, uh, for our second microdose event, uh, we'll be talking cannabis and San Pedro Australiana cultivation with Tom Forrest and Liam Engel. GarnStates.org is the website, and that will be on Wednesday, the 24th of March from 8pm again. Don't forget, uh, don't forget to subscribe 
to the EGA YouTube channel and also to the EGA newsletter where you'll get regular updates uh, on what's going on in the ethnobotanical world. My name's Nick. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Stick around for our final seedlings video, uh, which you can, you can find all of these videos on the EGA YouTube channel as well. And do find out about the project so you can submit if you're from, uh, if you've got something uh, that you would like screened to the community. Thank you. Bye bye. Appreciating the smaller and more subtle things in the world of nature and in your own consciousness. When it comes to psychoactive plants, many people seem to be more interested in pursuing the most powerful, potent psychedelics. Certain well-known people have extolled the virtues of taking heroic doses. Although this can be very rewarding, for some people it can be disastrous, especially if they don't have a good understanding of set and setting or reliable and wise friends to help them get through it. There has also been a glamorization of taking things to psychedelic extremes that has more than a hint of macho competitiveness and projects disdain towards people who can't deal with those levels of psychedelic excess or those who are honest enough to admit that it scares them. I think something is wrong with the way many people are approaching powerful psychedelics like DMT for example when they feel the need to use them as frequently as possible and yet find it difficult to express what exactly they are learning from it that they haven't already learned or couldn't have learned through less extreme means. I wonder if perhaps many people have trouble in paying attention to actually take in what they are being given without needing to be repeatedly bludgeoned by the weightiest Gnostic hammers in the cosmic toolbox. So, in light of this, let's discuss a little secret that isn't really a secret. High doses of psychedelics aren't necessary for a powerful and meaningful experience if you learn to be quiet and pay attention. Many people go through a psychedelic experience with lots of talking and dancing, which can be wonderful but can also be a distraction from the full potential of the experience. In fact, I believe many people take this approach precisely because it can reduce the intensity and increase the enjoyment so that the whole thing is more pleasant and less challenging. It's well known that if you withdraw from distractions and close your eyes, the experience instantly becomes more powerful and deep. Even with eyes open, simply gazing quietly at a point in the distance and meditating 
can lead to very deep places. The moment you start talking or decide to watch a movie or do something else, those depths of thought retreat and dissipate. If you take more moderate doses, it isn't necessary to be having wild, open-eyed visuals to be having a very powerful and meaningful psychedelic experience. All you need to do is minimise distractions, step back, be humble and open, and pay attention. If you practice opening your senses like this, you can find great depth in the smallest things without needing a mega dose to tear your third eye open by brute force. This brings us to the last part of this mini talk, which is about learning to appreciate the gifts of common garden plants that might not be powerful psychedelic teachers, but still have beneficial effects on the mind and body. Psychoactive plants are all around us, but many get overlooked, either because they are also quite toxic, or because they are mild enough or so common that people don't think of them as psychoactive. People with drug habits can find it hard to appreciate that milder plant drugs are doing anything at all, probably because their expectations of what a drug should do are higher, and their brain receptors may be desensitised to stimuli. These days, something like tea is not considered a psychoactive drug by many people, although when it was first introduced to Western society and people were more open to its effects, it was often drunk in quantities that resulted in exhilaration, and the moral party poopers of the time voiced concerns about teaism, which was the tea version of alcoholism. One beautiful group of plants, which are so common as to be overlooked as psychoactive, are the lavenders, which I've chosen as an example to finish on. Nearly everyone knows the sight and smell of lavender, which can be any one of the species or hybrids within the genus Lavandula which is part of the mint family. Some people react negatively to the smell of lavender, but most people find it very comforting and pleasant. This isn't just because we think it smells nice, or because it brings up some positive memories through association. Lavenders and many other aromatic plants do actually have a measurable effect on the central nervous system. Lavenders have been used in herbal medicine across the globe to treat anxiety, stress, depression, dizziness, insomnia, headaches, pain, and nausea. They are usually taken either as a tea made from the flowers, or the essential oil is inhaled or rubbed on the body. One species, Lavandula stecus, isn't much good at relieving anxiety, but in India it is believed to strengthen brain powers, expel brain crudities, and clarify the intellect. Most of the more common lavender species have essential oils that contain mostly a mix of linalool, and linalil acetate, but Lavandula stecus contains instead mostly fenchone, camphor, and eucalyptol. Experimental studies with essential oils and their main constituents have verified most of the central nervous system activities claimed for lavenders in rodents and humans. Lavenders rich in linalool and linalil acetate seem to act on glutamate receptors and serotonin receptors as well as increasing levels of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. All of this is pretty wonderful for a group of common plants that we take for granted, and that's just one example. Rather than seeking out exotic and rare plants and contributing to their exploitation, plant helpers can be found all around, right under your nose. Just like profound awareness can be found by paying attention to the little things that are right there. Now is certainly a good time to go small, and fully appreciate the subtle side we've been neglecting.